a year or two before I started work on Gorogoa, I was working on a comic, trying to make a graphic novel style comic, but I was having trouble with the story and that process kind of stalled. But I also realized that I was more interested in composing these panels uh, as a two-dimensional arrangement than I really was in telling a sequential story with the panels. And there was something about seeing all these little windows on screen at once. It was kind of like a quilt or a mosaic of little compartments that I found somehow fascinating. format seems simple at first. It's a game made up of panels. You can interact with the panels, move them around, split them apart. Some panels have holes in them. You can stack them on top of other panels. That causes the world to change. And finally, panels can connect horizontally or vertically. In Gorgoa, you can't physically interact with the world inside the tile at all. You can't open doors, you can't push buttons, you can only move your perspective. That was a design decision I made very early on, uh, and I had many reasons to question it as I was working on the game. It was partially an attempt to be minimal and, and elegant to kind of keep myself focused as a designer because what's interesting about Gorogoa is you know how it differs from a traditional adventure game the way pictures connect and stack that's what's exciting about the idea so I figured the entire design should be concentrated on that and that should be the only way to solve puzzles I think as a game designer you need to carefully manage the player's sense of, of entitlement if you give them a power, even a simple power, like physical interaction with the world, uh, and then you limit that power in any way, it's, it's frustrating. But if you drastically limit what the player can do uh, at the outset, then they, I think, will be more, in a sense, more grateful and more delighted by the fact that they're able to achieve things with their limited uh, ability set. I think the player's inability to touch things in the world makes the game more interesting in other ways. In Gorogoa, anything you can see in the distance on the horizon across the cityscape, you can travel to it. And that requires no particular physical explanation. And even more interesting, I think, you can enter a character's thoughts or memories. You can see a design on a plate, and you can just you can dive into it. At an even higher narrative level, limiting the player's uh, interaction, that opens the door to a wider range of sort of narrative and, and thematic interpretations for the game. It allows the entire game to feel like it could be a mental process, like the process of someone sifting through fragments of memory. Fragments that can't be changed directly, but where you might find new connections between fragments. And uh, that, that feeling is something that ended up resonating very strongly with the story in the game. One thing that you need to understand about Gorgoa is that a lot of the puzzles are actually very simple in concept. All the complexity and difficulty is in making them work visually. When two tiles connect like this, they have to be in visual harmony with each other, but they also have to be in visual harmony with the larger scenes that they belong to. So those are two constraints that fight against each other, and they force the two scenes, uh, which might take place at different, completely different points in the story, to be visually entangled with each other in all kinds of complicated ways. This puzzle in the game um, is very simple. It just involves a rock falling from tile to tile, but uh, it took months to finish because there are so many visual details that I had to work out. 
that made implementing simple puzzles extremely difficult for me. But I think the, the difficulty of executing something this way is why it seems improbable, and so why it seems magical. I've always liked to draw, and in particular I like compositions that have a, a lot of visual variety and complexity and, and texture. Scenes where the eye can spend a long time exploring, kind of roaming over every, every little detail. And it was really as much of a visual design project uh, early on as it was a game design project. I don't have much of a history as a game designer uh, before this one game. It's the first game I ever made. Prior to that, I was a software engineer. I quit my job in 2012 um, and basically was working on the game for five plus years. And that's I think that's partly because I didn't listen to the conventional advice, which is to, if you're making games, to start small and, you know, make your first few games very simple and small in scope. Um, and because I didn't do that, I wound up having to learn those same design lessons over the course of making one big game. And it took, you know, more than five years. <laughs> <laughs>